I don't know if you, any of you have had the opportunity to read uh, Lucy Shin's book, The Three-Body Problem. There's a Netflix show about it. It pales in comparison to the books. I think they're the peak of science fiction uh, at the moment. Um, but one of the challenges that's faced in the book is this idea that everything fades away. Like, they're trying to write a message and try to preserve it for, I think their goal is 100 million years. It's impossible. They, they find that there's nothing that lasts that long. And we, we, we see this in the world as well. Like, we see even like Uluru, right? It's a big rock. It hasn't changed in a long time. But it does have ridges on there where water's rubbed it away. And they had to close recently in 2019 because people were causing erosion. The people walking up on it were scuffing it, making it um, less... I don't know, they were just mucking it up. Uh, and that's a problem, because this thing is meant to sort of be this, this symbol of unchanging nature, but then it was being changed by people walking on it. And sort of we have this idea that some things don't change, like scientific theories or national borders or, you know, other things. But they, they do change over time. Everything changes. They, they shift sometimes in leaps and bounds, like... Technology used to be this sort of fixed thing that really didn't move much. And then once the Industrial Revolution came along, it just went in leaps and bounds and it doesn't seem to stop. And uh, other times, things move in increments, like infinitesimally, infinitis really small uh, <laughs> increments, really small increments. But they do change. Everything changes. And what we're seeing in this series is that everything changes but God. God's not like the things of this world. Everything in this world will come to pass away. Everything that we consider unchangeable, solid, eternal will pass away. But God remains the same. The God of Isaac, the God of Abraham, and the God of Jacob. Last week, we looked at the God of Abraham. He's an ordinary man. He was called to leave his home of Ur in Mesopotamia and journey towards this everlasting covenant, this, this covenant that was not just for Abraham, but it was for descendants, Isaac and Jacob, and ultimately all of God's people. And we, we saw that this God remains unchanged. His faithfulness is established in this covenant with Abraham. It's the same faithfulness that we rely on today. And so we cherish these Old Testament narratives because they reveal the nature of God, this unchanging nature who faithfully upholds the same promises that he made thousands of years ago. So just as he was faithful to Abraham, he's faithful to us. We learned this last week. And so we saw throughout Abraham's life that he was tested. He was waiting for this promised son for a long time. He went through a lot of hardship and famine. And then he had to sacrifice that long-awaited son but today we see the next character in the story, this character in, in Genesis, this story that God is telling us, this long-awaited son, this bona fide sacrificial lamb, Isaac, the second of the patriarchs, is who we're looking at this morning. And the character of Isaac, in the story of Isaac, I think we see three distinct characteristics of God that are interconnected. Three facets of the mighty and faithful God that remains unchanging. So we're going to look at three characteristics this morning that all are subsumed under one general characteristic. First one is going to be that God is a faithful promise keeper. We can trust that God will do as he says. Secondly, he's a faithful provider. We can trust that God provides for those who he loves. Thirdly, we're going to see that he's a faithful protector God is just, and he will defend his covenant people. But we're going to see most importantly that these three traits, as beautiful and wonderful as they are, are tied back to his covenantal faithfulness. God's character is marked, it's unwavering, it's unending nature in his commitment to his covenantal promises. So first thing we're going to look at is that God is a faithful promise keeper. The God that Isaac worshipped and trusted keeps his word to the letter. And so to determine whether has someone has kept a promise, I think we need to establish the nature and the boundaries of the promise made. Think about the Titanic. On a, when it set sail on the 10th of April, 1912. And just before that, it was touted as the most luxurious ship ever to be made. And one of the, the, the things that was being sold about it was that it was unsinkable. 
It was this unsinkable ship. It was the owners were touting this luxury liner as unsinkable. The media was taking that up and they were pretty sold on it. Um, but how accurate was that promise? I think we all know that story pretty well. That sank four days later. Uh, it was proven to be false. They promised it was unsinkable, but it wasn't. Or politicians, campaign promises. Uh, I think uh, I remember George, I don't remember this, I wasn't alive, but George Bush Sr. is pretty famous for his, uh, what is it, read my lips, no new taxes. That was, that was, a, that was like he's famous for not following through on this promise. It was two years later that he brings in new taxes. And he claims it was because, you know, different financial circumstances, different promises, but he had to backtrack his promises. And they say it cost him the campaign against Bill Clinton. People can't tolerate someone who goes against their promises. We hate being lied to. We hate being sold on something that is untrue. We don't hate second-hand car salesmen, but I think we sometimes have a little bit of distrust towards them. I've been uh, taken advantage of, I'm sure, by them at times. Um, but it's, so it's important that we evaluate God's promises to see whether he does keep them. Like, is, is this guy trustworthy? Is the God of Isaac actually trustworthy? And so we're going to look at some of the specific promises concerning Isaac and see, did God keep those promises? So the first one we're going to look at, we did look at this last week, but I want to look at it again, is the promise of the promised son. So in Genesis 12, God says to Abraham, Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land I will show you. And I will make of you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great, so that you will be a blessing. This promise is made more explicit in chapter 15, where God says, where Abraham comes before God, frustrated that he hasn't gotten his son yet. He hasn't gotten an heir. So God, God brings him outside and he says, look towards the heavens and number the stars, if you're able to number them. Then he said to him, so shall your offspring be. In the next chapter, very next chapter, Abraham's frustrated at God again. So he takes matters into his own hands. He uh, makes a uh, son with his servant Hagar, tries to do it in his own strength. And God, God's not satisfied with this. But God, so God clarifies his promise to Abraham. He makes it more specific. He says, as for Sarai, your wife, you shall not call her name Sarai, but Sarah shall be her name. I will bless her, and moreover, I will give you a son by her. I will bless her, and she will become nations. Kings of people shall come from her. Then Abraham fell on his face and laughed and said to himself, Shall a child be born to a man who is hundreds of year, 100 years old? Shall Sarah, who is 90 years old, bear a child? And Abraham said to God, Oh, that Ishmael might live before you. And God said, No, but Sarah, your wife, shall bear you a son, and you shall call his name Isaac. I will establish my covenant with him as an everlasting covenant for his offspring after him. As for Ishmael, I have heard you. Behold, I have blessed him and will make him fruitful and multiply him greatly. He shall father twelve princes, and I will make him into a great nation." But I will establish my covenant with Isaac, whom Sarah shall bear to you at this time next year. So there's some, there's some specifics to this promise. The mother will be Sarah, not Hagar. Secondly, the child will come in one year's time. Thirdly, kings will come from her. And fourthly, God will establish his covenant with Isaac, not Ishmael. The second promise we're going to look at is the promise of land. In chapter 26, it says, Now there was a famine in the land, beside the former famine that was now in the days of Abraham. And Isaac went to Gerah, to Abimelech, king of the Philistines. And the Lord appeared to him and said, Do not go down to Egypt. Dwell in the land of which I shall tell you. Sojourn in this land, and I will be with you and will bless you. For to you and your offspring I will give all these lands. And I will establish the oath that I swore to Abraham, your father. I will multiply your offspring as the stars of the heaven, and I will give to your offspring all these lands. And in your offspring, all the nations of the earth shall be blessed. So there's some, there's some pointers to this promise, isn't there? There's, there's a couple of specifics. God will be with him and bless him. That's the first one. 
Secondly, Isaac and his offspring will be given this land, the land of Canaan. We saw that this promise has some parameters to it in chapter 15. Um, It would take 400 years for this promise to be fulfilled. There would be a time of slavery for Isaac and Abraham's descendants, but it would be given to them, this land of Canaan. Thirdly, Isaac's offspring, like Abraham's, will be multiplied. And fourthly, all of Abraham or Isaac's offsprings will be blessed, will bless the world. So, last week we saw that this first promise was answered. Isaac was born to Sarah, even in her impossibly old age of 90. In Genesis 21, it says, The Lord visited Sarah as he had said, and the Lord did to Sarah as he had promised. And Sarah conceived and bore Abraham a son in his old age at the time of which God had spoken to him. So two aspects of the promise are fulfilled here. At that time, and a son was born to Sarah. The second aspect is that kings will come to Sarah's sons. The books of 1st and 2nd Kings, 1st and 2nd Chronicles, are all testaments to the amount of kings, whether good or bad, that came from Sarah. And finally, we saw the the, the the fourth aspect of the promise fulfilled in chapter 26. The covenant is extended to Isaac. The second promise we also see answered throughout the Old Testament. God continues to deliver on his second promise. We saw that God promised to be with Isaac and to bless him throughout his life. Like his father, he faced some challenges in chapter 26. It looked like he would probably fail. It looked like Isaac might die. He might might die to famine, so he had to go to Gerar. So he deceived King Abimelech, like his father had done, he lied to the king, said Rebekah's wife was his sister to avoid being killed. Um, Just upstanding the eyes, these patriarchs, aren't they? Uh, But Abimelech discovers the truth. He rebukes Isaac and he orders people not to harm him. Later, Isaac prospers in the land. He conflicts conflicts with the the Philistines over water rights and eventually he finds peace in Beersheba where he digs a well and God reaffirms his covenant promise this is the key bit so Abimelech recognized God's favor on Isaac it's a peace treaty they make a covenant to ensure mutual non-aggression so God had promised that Isaac would be blessed And then we see that Abimelech, a non-believer, recognizes that Isaac is blessed. So God followed through on that one as well. So clearly God was with Isaac and blessed him. The second aspect of the second promise is that Isaac's descendants are promised the land of Canaan. And this promise does take a while to be answered, but it was said that it would take a while. In Exodus 3.8, After 400 years of slavery, God in his commitment to his promises delivers the descendants of Isaac from bondage to the Egyptians. Right when God would have been shown to be a liar, when it looks like the 400 year time would lapse, God comes in and saves his people. We see this in Joshua 1.23 where they're standing at 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 the threshold to the land of Canaan about to take possession. And then throughout the book of Joshua, it's just them fulfilling God's promise, taking over town after town, city after city. And then finally, in Joshua 21, it says, The Lord gave to Israel all the land that he swore to their fathers, and they took possession of it, and they settled there. And the Lord gave them rest on every side, just as he had sworn to their fathers. Not one of all their enemies had withstood them. For the Lord had given all their enemies into their hands. Not one word of all the good promises that the Lord had made to the house of Israel had failed. All came to pass. So from the story of Isaac, we see that the God of Isaac is faithful to his promises. He does what he says he will do. He doesn't backtrack. He doesn't change the parameters of the promise. He fulfills his obligations to the letter. So God made these promises to the patriarchs, to Abraham, to Isaac, to Jacob. And these promises were grand. They were promises of this great rich land, promises of rest from external enemies, promises of many descendants. And he came through on these promises. 
But one of the, the most beautiful things about that we see as we read through the whole of Scripture is that God fulfills promises and then he oversupplies on those promises. He often gives so much more than a surface level reading of those promises might give. In many ways, the promises given to Isaac, promises given to Abraham, promises given to Jacob foreshadow a greater fulfillment in the New Testament. We see this over and over and over again, where individuals and narratives and promises have ty- are types of Christ and types of the gifts that God brings. These point to Christ and point to the gifts that we ourselves now bear the fruits of. For example, the promise of the land of Canaan. Canaan was synonymous in the minds of the Israelite people with rest and peace and contentment. And this idea was rooted in their broader covenantal relationship between God and themselves. But it wasn't just physical territory. It was this idea of divine blessing and protection and prosperity that came with the land of Canaan. And so the people of Israel did enter the land of Canaan. And so they did possess that rest and that land. And so they got some level of rest. But it wasn't entirely the rest they expected. It wasn't long until they started getting conflict from all sides. Um, And so, yeah, so the the author of Hebrews expands on this. And he says, The rest in Canaan was only a temporary physical rest, not the spiritual rest of peace with God. So they had these external conflicts. What they didn't realize, what the rest they really needed was peace with God because they were at enmity with God. So as we see in the New Testament, the rest that Canaan foreshadows is found in Christ alone. The author of Hebrews recontextualizes the rest that was expected by the people of Israel. The rest is about experiencing a deep and lasting peace, a close relationship with God marked by trusting in his promises and no longer trying to earn our righteousness through our own efforts. It's resting on the promise made by Christ that those in him who trust in him will have their rest. In Matthew eleven twenty-eight, 28, he says, Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Even the story of Isaac, the son of the promise, has greater meaning in Christ. Christ is the long-awaited son promised in Genesis 3. He will crush the head of the serpent. He did crush the head of the serpent, fulfilling thousands of years of waiting. So what we learn from these stories of the patriarchs, this story of Isaac, that God is faithful to his promises. And believers are given a numerous wonderful promises, assurances from the God of Isaac, the God who's proven himself countless times to be unwaveringly reliable in every situation. We do have to be careful. There are some things we have not been promised that we often get told we're being promised. We're not promised health, wealth, and prosperity. We're not promised a comfortable life. Too many preachers try to twist God's word and malign God's word to make it fit into that narrative. But we do have some promises from God. We do have some very explicit promises from God. Here's a quick fire list of absolute assurances from God. Number one, forgiveness of sins for those who believe. Ephesians 1, 7, Paul writes, In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our sins according to the riches of his grace. Number two, adoption as children, the right to become children of God. Number three, eternal life. We all know John chapter 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. That's a promise. The indwelling Holy Spirit. John 14, 16 through 17. Jesus promises this. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper to be with you forever, even the Spirit of truth. He, Christ, will be with us by his Spirit. He will guide us and comfort us in our weakness. Number five, that we will be sanctified. Philippians 1, 6 assures believers, I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Christ. 
Number six, resurrection and glorification. Romans 8, 11 says, If the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give you life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. That's a promise of resurrection on the last day for those who believe. I am so excited about that. Number seven, this is the final one. Christ's eventual and imminent return to judge the living and the dead. Christ is coming back. He's not gone forever. I'll put these in this week's study to think about more. We can trust in these promises. God is faithful to these assurances. He will answer them to the letter. So let these, let these promises dwell in our hearts. That's, that's my goal for this morning. That if you're saved, you are loved as God's children. You have a comforter in the Holy Spirit. You will grow to be more like Christ. You will eagerly await Christ's return and your bodily re- resurrection. As you dwell on, this, on these promises, you will experience greater peace. You will grow in strengthening faith over time. You will grow in a deeper reliance on the Holy Spirit. You will grow to be more like Christ. So having seen that God is faithful to his promises, let's look at our second point and see how God faithfully provides for his people. How the story of Isaac shows how God is a provider. Isaac's story is a wonderful picture of God's provision. Um, most of you are familiar with story, Isaac's story of being sacrificed. We talked about it last week. I just talked about it then. But this week, I want to show you how this story points to the greater fulfillment in Christ. Isaac was, in large part, a voluntary p- participant in this sacrifice deal. Um, it doesn't seem like he knew the whole story, but it does seem like he went along without complaining too bitterly. Um, Isaac, Abraham didn't have to cajole him onto the altar. Um, and so this comes back to this, this idea of types in the Old Testament. In this capacity, Isaac served as a type of Christ. He was voluntary. Christ was voluntary. But he also highlighted the fact that we are in dire need of replacement or substitution. One of the fundamental theological claims of the Christian faith is that through Adam, we are sinners in the eyes of a holy and righteous God. We have sinned against God, and on account of that sin, we deserve death. So what is promised in Genesis 3 is that there will be a substitute for us, someone who will die in our place. But Isaac is not that person. There's a few reasons why Isaac was not a viable substitute. Firstly, Isaac was a sinner. His death wouldn't have been sufficient. He, along with the rest of the world, required atonement and forgiveness. Hebrews 7 makes it clear that only a sinless sacrifice can meet the divine standard. Secondly, to atone for the world, the sins of the world, the sacrifice had to be of infinite value. The offense of our sin is against an infinitely holy God. So the, the sacrifice has to be infinitely valuable. Isaac was just a human. He lacked the divine nature necessary to atone for the sins of the whole world. Only Jesus, the Son of God, who is fully divine, fully human. We talked about this at discipleship group leader meeting on Tuesday, the idea of the hypostatic union. It's a big word, but it's this, this beautiful picture of that God is like Jesus is both fully God and fully human. It's one of the mysteries of the Christian faith, but it is absolutely integral to this idea that Isaac, uh, so at Jesus, had to be fully human to be standing in our place, but also fully divine to merit the or to 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 satisfy God's righteousness. And so. Jesus is the only sufficient sacrifice to satisfy the justice of a holy God. But Isaac's near sacrifice foreshadowed the true and ultimate sacrifice that God himself provided in Jesus Christ. So in that sense, Isaac is a type. But in a, in a more full sense, the ram is the better type. The ram is... If we don't know the story, Isaac and Abraham are up on the altar. Isaac's about to get sacrificed, and God provides a ram in a thicket. And so the ram acts as a substitute for Isaac. 
dying in his place. This foreshadows Christ's redemptive work and sacrificial work. He, like that ram, died in our place, taking on the death we deserve. And this points to, the provision of the ram points to the provision of Christ for us. A second story that we get from Isaac's narrative is how he finds a bride, how God provides a bride for Isaac. So let's take a look at chapter 24. I'm not going to read that whole story. It's the longest chapter in Genesis. It takes about, I think, like six minutes to read through, so I'm not going to do it. Um, But in summary, Abraham sends his servant, it's probably a guy called named Eliezer, to find a wife for his son Isaac from his own relatives back in Mesopotamia. So the servant goes back to Abraham's homeland. He prays for guidance, and he meets this girl called Rebecca who offers him water, and then she offers water for his camels as well, fulfilling the sign that he had asked from God. So Rebecca agrees to marry Isaac and returns with the servant. They meet, marry, and she becomes another key figure in the Genesis narrative. There is yet again a beautiful picture of God's provision for Isaac and for Rebecca. So once again, this points to something greater The story prefigures Christ and his bride, the church. It also prefigures the role and the gift of the Holy Spirit. If you look through this passage, there are six key ideas that highlight this typology. Firstly, Abraham sends his servant. In verses 1 through 9, we see Abraham is concerned that no bride in the Canaanite region be married to Isaac. He doesn't want a Canaanite woman to marry into the family. And so he sends his servant to find Isaac a bride. In this typology, it seems that Abraham is acting in the role of God the Father. He initiates the plan of salvation to bring Christ and his bride together. We see this played out in Ephesians 1. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. For he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. In love, he predestined us for adoption to sonship through Christ Jesus in accordance accordance with his pleasure and will, to the praise of his glorious grace, which he has freely given to us in the one he loves. The second type is that Isaac serves as the type of Christ. He is the beloved son. He's submissive to the father's will. He's already been offered up. He awaits his bride. The third type is the servant. This, in a sense, prefigures the sending of the Holy Spirit. He's sent for the Son to seek the bride for the Son. The servant doesn't speak for himself. He speaks in the name of the Father and of the Son. He points to the Son and serves the Son in a similar way. The Holy Spirit summons Christ's bride and brings glory to the Son. Number four, Rebecca serves as a type as well. She is the bride in this story. She's called to leave her family and her former life. In a sense, this prefigures the calling that the gospel has on unbelievers to leave our former lives and follow Christ. Luke 14 makes it clear that following Christ often comes at a personal cost. In some parts of the world, it comes at tremendous cost. It means leaving family and friends Means And yeah, suffering persecution on account of it. The fifth type is the meeting of Isaac and Rebekah. In a similar fashion, Isaac went out to meet Rebekah. He took her to his mother's tent. In a similar fashion, Christ will come to meet his bride and bring us into the new creation. This is what we all eagerly await as believers. We see a picture of this in Revelation 19, where the bride and the groom are united at the wedding feast. So just as Rebecca joined Isaac's family, we will be welcomed into Christ's kingdom. We will have perfect fellowship with Christ and be made new. We eagerly await the new creation. This is why I cry at every wedding, no matter what. Every wedding. I always cry. I had a wedding last week in Malaysia. My sister-in-law got married. I was so excited. But whenever that bride starts to walk down the aisle, I just tear up because it's just this beautiful picture. I think this is why weddings are fantastic, by the way. Um, 
Every time the bride walks out, it's this, this, it, it symbolizes, what it's symbolizing is this bride coming to the groom and this, this, this eternal thing that we've been waiting for. We, like, this is what we eagerly await, the uniting of ourselves with Christ eternally. That's why weddings are the coolest. I always cry. It's going to be my biggest challenge when I'm a pastor and having to marry people is that I'm just going to be standing there bawling more than the groom. It's, it's going to be classic. The third thing that this, the sixth thing that this, uh, this story tells us, is, shows us, is God's sovereign hand in choosing the bride. The story emphasizes God's hand in this process. Eliezer prayed and God answered and demonstrated his divine sovereignty. He provides a bride. And these, these, these ancient narratives aren't just, they don't just stay in the ancient narrative. They're vibrant reflections of God's unchanging character and intimate involvement in our lives. They're not just stories. They have deep theological meaning and actual practical application to today's life. These accounts reveal a God who's not just distant. He doesn't just sit up in the clouds watching. He's deeply present. He provides a ram in place of Isaac. He provides Jesus as a sacrifice, an ultimate sacrifice for us. This divine provision isn't just a historical event. It presents a reality that changes everything. It means that no matter our past, we are not left to bear the weight of our own sins. Jesus is our perfect sacrifice. This truth invites us to live out in the freedom and grace that only God's provision can offer, filling our hearts with profound gratitude and awe. In the same way, the story of Isaac and Rebekah demonstrate his meticulous care for the minutia of our life. He cares about the little things in your life. Just as he guided every detail to fulfill his promise to Isaac, he's at work in the details of your lives today. So God doesn't just care about your spiritual needs. He actually cares about your daily needs as well. He's not distantly watching from afar. He cares. And the, beauty thing, the beautiful thing is we can bring our needs and our wants to God and, and, and he cares and he provides. That's the beautiful thing about our Christian faith because he provides in his timing and in his way. Okay. This leads us to our final point. The story of Isaac is a faithful testament of how God is a faithful protector. He safeguards his people it's intrinsic to God's nature to protect his covenant people. We see this evident throughout the Isaac narrative. A few instances came to mind. In chapter six, Isaac is 26, sorry. Isaac is faced with a challenge. A famine drives Isaac to have to reside in Gerar. There is a fear of being killed. Rebekah is beautiful, and so he lies. Abimelech discovers, Abimelech confronts, Abimelech protects. Uh, so God's showing protection over Isaac. This episode highlights that despite how, frankly, terrible some of our patriarchs are, God's plans cannot be thwarted by our human failings. We see that God's protection is tied to his covenantal promises to Isaac. God will ensure that he will keep his promises and his covenantal obligations. Later in the story, Isaac's wealth and success become the envy of the, the Philistines. And so they start to dispute over water rights. They start taking some of his wells, filling them in. And so there's this risk that he'll be driven, driven out into the desert to die. But his servants keep finding new wells. And God's provision, new wells are dug wherever he goes. So we see this theme of God being a protector all throughout the, New, the Old Testament. In the Psalms, God is often called a fortress, a rock, a refuge. Martin Luther's song, A Mighty Fortress, it's not the most exciting tune, but it has some beautiful theology about how God protects us from the evil one. There is nothing that can come against us because we have a mighty God that we reside in. This highlights how even when the devil himself attacks, we can be sure that God protects us. In the prophets, we see this theme evident as well. Even when the people of God are being sent into exile, we get this promise of protection. One of the more misused passages in Scripture is Jeremiah 29, 11. 
It says, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for welfare and not for evil, to give you a future and a hope. Many people treat this passage as this sort of personal promise from God that he's going to give them wealth, health, and prosperity. But in the context of the passage, Jeremiah is pronouncing judgment on Israel. God's about to send, to send the Israelite people into 70 years of exile. But there is hope in this passage. God's not going to abandon his people. He's going to protect his people from complete destruction. And he's going to fulfill his promises. Ultimately, we see God's protective nature most startlingly in the New Testament. We see that the ultimate protection is found in Christ. One of the key examples of this is how Christ calls himself a shepherd all the time. I think we have a warped view of what a shepherd looked like. We, I, even back then, we sort of think he just sort of hung out with his sheep, stopped them wandering off too far, you know, dragged them out of a ditch when they got lost, sort of just cuddling lambs, having a grand old time, that sort of thing. But David, actually, in his account to, to Saul in, in uh, the book of Samuel, shows that there's a lot more to being a shepherd during this sort of era than... Uh, they might come to mind. In, the, in 1 Samuel 17, David, speaking to Saul, recounts his life as a shepherd. He says, Your servant used to keep sheep for his father. And when there came a lion or a bear and took a lamb from the flock, I went after him and struck him and delivered it out of his mouth. And if he arose against me, I caught him by his beard and struck him and killed him. Your servant has struck down both lions and bears, and this uncircumcised Philistine shall be like one of them. For he has defied the armies of the living God. And David said, The Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion, from the paw of the bear, will deliver me from the hand of this Philistine. Notice how even as a shepherd, David sees God as a protector. That's just a side note. We also see in Job, that, that they had to defend against people as well. The Sabaeans raid Job's flock. They kill his servants or his shepherds, demonstrating that banditry was also a huge problem in the ancient world. So the role of a shepherd was a dangerous life. It required great strength and bravery to do. So it's particularly relevant that Christ calls himself a shepherd. In John 10, Jesus describes himself as the good shepherd, who lays down his life for the sheep. So he contrasts himself with a hired shepherd, just a hireling, who doesn't own the sheep. He runs away when the wolf comes, leaving the sheep to be scattered. In Christ, we have a good shepherd who's, committing to, who's committed to keeping his flock safe. Romans 8, 38 makes it clear that he will guard us to the last day. Those who are in Christ will remain in Christ. Or in John, 39, John 6, 39, it says, And this is the will of, of him who sent me, that I should lose nothing of all that he has given me, but raise it up on the last day. For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who looks on the Son and believes in him should have eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. So we have a God who is a protector of his covenant People. So as we look at the story of Isaac, we see that God is sovereign even over our complex and challenging lives. As we grow in our understanding of God's character, we will see that we will get deeper trust. We'll, our trust will grow for this God whose character is so wonderful. We need to be careful that we're not guaranteed protection from suffering or pain. But the New Testament does give us more assurances of what sort of protection God will give us. Firstly, we get the spiritual protection. We talked about this. In John 17, Jesus says, My prayer is not that you will take them out of this world, but that you will protect them from the evil one. Jesus prays for the protection of his followers from Satan, indicating that while believers live in a fallen world, they are safeguarded from spiritual harm. We don't need to be overly concerned about the forces of evil. It's not that they're not real. But they can't, they can't do harm to us as believers. Secondly, we're promised eternal protection. In John chapter 10, it says, I give them eternal life and they shall never perish. No one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all. No one can snatch them out of my hand, my Father's hand. 
Jesus assures believers that they are secure in the Father's hands. You are secure. If you are a believer, you are safe in the Father's hands. We're also protected from condemnation. Romans 8.1 says that there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Believers are protected through Christ. We have a sure place in God's kingdom. We're also protected from falling away. 1 Peter 1.5 says, Who through faith are shielded by God's power until the coming of the salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. In these things we can be confident that God will protect those who he has in his hand. Those who he has covenanted with before the foundation of the earth to save. One thing I hope that you've noticed is that all of these points come under the overarching fact that God is committed to his covenant with his people. He keeps his promises, he provides, he protects because he is committed to keeping his covenant. A covenant which has broader spiritual fulfillment in Christ. The Abrahamic covenant extends to believers through the new covenant. So this is foretold in Jeremiah chapter 1, where it's promised a new covenant. And then this new covenant is established by Christ. Believers are seen as heirs of the promises of Christ, not by physical descent, but through faith in Christ. So when we read these stories, we're reminded of this wonderful and faithful God, a God who keeps his promises, a God who provides for our everyday and spiritual needs, a God who protects us from ourselves and from the forces of evil, a God who keeps us and protects us, raising us up on the last day, cleansed and made holy by the blood of Christ. So as we go into a time of communion, let's just remember this this wonderful promise that God has given us, that we are secure by that blood and by that body. That, that was offered up for us, that we may be saved. If you're not a believer, we just ask that you remain seated. But we do want, you to encu- want to encourage you to just think about the promises that God has given to those who believe. So if you're not a believer, we just talk to someone. We would love for you to chat. Come talk to me, come talk to Dawn, Don, come talk to Harold. We'd love to tell you more about this God that we believe in. This God who has established himself as the God of this world thousands of years ago and is still the same today that same promise of salvation through faith is free today let's pray and then we'll eat heavenly father you are a god who has promised so many good things to us you have promised to save us from ourselves promised to save us from uh, the forces of evil uh, promised to save us from our own sin Lord, we pray that as we go about our weeks, you would constantly remind us of your wonderful character, the character which provides for us, protects us. And uh, yeah, I can't remember the third one. <laughs> Lord, we ask that you would uh, continue to uh, just help us grow as believers as we proclaim your name throughout this world. In Jesus' name, amen.